the conservation leadership table. This is my favorite quote of all by an amazing person named Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. And her quote is, well-behaved women rarely make history. Welcome, Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you, citizen scientists, Earthwatch scientists, this amazing conservation community. So this is not the original presentation I had, but it'll work. OK, so I am going to talk about the dewilding and the dewilding to give you the scientific foundation for what I do. And this is a map of eight species of carnivores in North America. This was created by Andrea La Liberté for her doctoral work working with Bill Ripple at Oregon State. And what they did was they looked at the Lewis and Clark expedition journals, they looked at the Thompson expedition journals from the Canadian regions, and they used that data and it was, it was kind of like citizen science because they were on the same level as someone like Thoreau. They were not professional scientists and mapped those ranges. So everything from grizzly bears to uh, cougars and wolves and a lot of other creatures. So there's eight of them. This is 2004. So the reason for these range contractions has to do with humans killing them. So this is what we call the dewilding. But today, we're seeing a rewilding. So this is 2004. And if we were to draw this map again today, these ranges would come down about like that. And there's wolves spilling down into here. And so there's a wolf in California now. Um, it's amazing what's going on. And what's going on, it's, um, there's one reason for it. And that is because we have decided to make room for the large carnivores. And there's a variety of reasons for that. I will be talking about the scientific reasons, but it also has to do with what several of the speakers today have talked about, is humans revisioning our relationship with the natural world. And there's a critical need for that because nature is in trouble. And we're in trouble because of things like climate change and a human population that is growing beyond anything we could have imagined even 20 years ago. These are the actual ranges of these carnivores. Well, this is uh, only six carnivore species, the ones I wrote about in my book, The Carnivore Way, um, as of about six months ago. And these are breeding populations. So you can see that since 2004, in just one decade, there's been a tremendous spreading out of these species. And the reason they do that is because the ma the, most of these carnivores disperse. Some of them make astonishing dispersals. And many of you have probably heard about the wolf that went from northern, northeastern Oregon almost 1,000 miles to northern California. Um, there was a cougar that ended up in Connecticut, and it traveled over 2,000 miles from North Dakota. And those are only the ones that happen to have radio collars on that we know about. There's many others that have been making these movements. So the rewilding, um, this is a map. So I'm, um, I'm a scholar that transcends genres. I'm also a, a nature writer, and I edit a literary journal. And this is a, an illustration that we're publishing in the literary journal that I edit called Whitefish Review. Um, and it is a, the theme of that issue is the geography of hope. And certainly the rewilding is part of that geography of hope. So this is an artist's rendition, uh, Curtis Edson, who was actually a scientist. He teaches at West Point. Um, he started out as an artist many years ago, and this is his depiction of what the carnivores are doing. So the rewilding means not just letting these animals you know, live in places from which they had long been missing, but it's allowing these ecological processes to continue, to resume the way they were over evolutionary time. We've broken those relationships, so reinstating those. And, and you've heard people talk about trophic, that means food, cascades. So these are the linkages between species that are related to predators and their prey. 
It recognizes that nature is a community. So it's not just about, well, let's return wolves. It's let's return the processes that wolves are driving. And you can apply this to any species that you can think of. It allows nature to find its own way. And that means by these evolutionary couplings are very powerful. These species co-evolve together. What makes an elk an elk is that it evolved over millennia with an animal such as the wolf chasing it. And that shaped its limbs. It shaped its senses. So it just means allowing nature to come back together. So my research has taken place in the crown of the continent ecosystem. This is what I call the carnivore way. It's this corridor that goes from Alaska to Mexico. Um, when the glaciers melted, this pathway opened up between them. This was about 11,000 years ago. And many of the species that we have in the lower 48 United States came down through that corridor including plant species. So this is a very powerful corridor. Well, when we started rewilding North America, guess which corridor those species used first? That same corridor. These relationships are very old. They're, they're evolutionary. So that is the crown of the continent. That's also where I lived for 20 years in a cabin with two and a half million acres of wilderness as my backyard. I recently moved here to work at Earthwatch. And it is a, I made my own dispersal. And this is an amazing place to be. But living there for 20 years, I learned some very powerful lessons and eventually became a scientist. This is what wolves do. This is an illustration from Terra Magazine, uh, an article about trophic cascades that appeared in 2008 about Bill Ripple's work and my work. And you see a wolf holds a whole world in its mouth. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how that works. But wolves have the ability to touch everything in the food webs in which they occur. It has to do with wolves killing their prey, which in the system that I study are primarily elk. That's about 90% of wolf diet. But it isn't just about killing. It has to do with fear. And uh, you heard Jay Nichols talk about um, you know, these warm and fuzzy, happy feelings and how beneficial they are. But fear also serves a very important role in the natural world. And when you get rid of that fear, then other things start to unravel. So this is a vigilant elk. This is an image from my research. You see its, its eyes are looking around. Its head is above its shoulder. It's on high alert. When you take the wolf away, what happens, the wolf is the only species that can consistently prey on elk in that system because, because elk are so big. So a cougar can't consistently take, uh, take down an adult elk. So basically, elk are left without any predators. So they uh, start behaving like livestock. They stand around with their heads down, eating all the time. When you bring back wolves, everything changes. So an elk that isn't on high alert like that is, has a very high chance of being killed by a wolf. This is what happens. This is an area. This is from my research. This is an alpha female we didn't even know existed. She has the heart of an elk in her mouth. We were about 50 yards from her. So I look at landscapes. Elk like to run with their, head, their heads up and their legs stiff. They're very closely related to camels and horses. So they are not very good at jumping over things. They, they can do it, but they don't like to do it. So this is a burned forest. And I had measured it the day before. I had pulled a transect there with my crew, which consisted half of volunteers. And they measured that this had a lot of debris and a lot of obstacles. And gee, if you're an elk, this would be a very dangerous site. Well, guess what? The next day, this alpha female obliged us with an ecology lesson. This is a young bull elk. It's like a yearling elk. We call them spike bulls. And a wolf can normally outrun an elk um, by about 5 to 10 miles an hour, a healthy elk. So elk have, I mean, an elk can outrun the wolf. So elk have this very strong advantage. However, when wolves are successful at killing elk, it's either because the elk is weak and sick or because it's foolish. 
And those young elk can be very foolish, just like the young of any species. So what happened was this elk was doing OK. It had a whole pack of wolves chasing it. But then it decided that it was going to get away from those wolves once and for all by running down a steep embankment onto a frozen lake. And you can see the skid marks. And, and those are all wolf tracks, all of those pock marks on the snow. So I wanted to know when I started my doctoral work in 2006, um, would wolves have an ecological effect on a community? And if so, would it always be the same everywhere? So returning wolves would mean instant trophic cascades. How might context influence this? So things like fire, for example. And I want to point out this image here. So that's, that's Yellowstone. That's a pack of wolves. There's radio color data that shows those wolves are using that area heavily. Look at those aspen trees in the background. So a trophic cascade means with wolves in that system, uh, elk have to be on high alert. They can't stand around mowing down the aspen, so that'll give aspen a break, and the aspen will start growing above the height that elk could eat them. And then that will allow animals like songbirds to prosper, right? Well, this is an area of high wolf use, and look at those aspens. So I wanted to know what's going on here. Um, this is a uh, remote camera image from my project, this one up here. And you can see that elk, it's a female elk, and she successfully fought off that wolf. So there, you know, there's a dynamic here. These are not static relationships. In fact, they're very complex. And I wanted to really probe into nature's tangled bank because there was and still is this pretty heated debate about, well, we don't really need wolves or we don't really need carnivores because these relationships aren't really happening. So here's my study site, and this is actually where my Earthwatch project uh, will be taking place. I'm fielding uh, the first team uh, next July. This is elk winter range. Those little dots are elk. And um, this is winter in that landscape. This is a Waterton Lakes National Park, Alberta, which is just north of the US-Canada border. Winter lasts about 10 months there. So um, it doesn't get quite as windy as it does in Churchill, but it gets pretty cold. Anyway, um, they go into these, these undulating, um, it's kind of a savanna, um, where the snow doesn't get so deep. The snow doesn't usually get above a meter in height, and that is where the elk hang out. And this is a herd of about 2,000 elk. So it's characterized by, it's a grassland matrix. Elk mainly eat grass, but there are clumps of aspen. And in January, when the nutritional value of the grass really drops and there's not that much good grass left anyway, they switch to eating aspen, which has a very high protein level and also uh, it, it has a lot of calcium in it. Um, there's also shrubs in here. So this is, this is elk winter range. And we're measuring how what the wolves are doing is affecting the elk and how that's affecting the plant communities. So here's the conceptual model for what I'm studying. You start with the macro environment, which is you know, what makes things grow. So you have moisture and you have sunlight. That enables aspen to grow. This is the bottom-up hypothesis, by the way, as it's called. That creates food for elk. That's one of my GPS collared elk. That then provides food for wolves. And this is an alpha male wolf, and that's a trail camera image. Um, on the other hand, the top-down perspective is that wolves um, affect elk by killing them and scaring them, and that in turn affects how aspen grow. And then when you add disturbance to that mix, you get energy cycling through that system much more vigorously. So what's going to happen? So these relationships have been studied as early as the 1920s by Sir Charles Elton, the British ecologist, who created most of the concepts we use in ecology today. My Earthwatch project, um, I'm working, I'm the lead investigator working with David Hibbs and Dan Donato, and this is an outgrowth of my PhD work and my postdoc work, so now we're taking it one step further. And we're looking at the role of prescribed fire in affecting these dynamics. 
this year, the park set this uh, another fire for me. So the first fire was uh, a 1,200 hectare fire. This is a 2,300 hectare fire. And it, it's a gorgeous, it's like something out of a textbook. And they used my data, data that I've always used volunteers, so that the volunteers and I collected data on how the aspen were growing and aspen stand size. And then they used those data to, uh, to calibrate the fire severity into a multifactorial experimental design. So uh, the National Parks in Canada, Parks Canada, are a partner in the research, and they funded my research for many years, and now they're, they're providing fire and they're housing my crew. They're wonderful to work with. I visited this site six weeks after this image was um, taken, and the prairie, if you were not a fire expert, you wouldn't know that it had burned. It was totally covered with wildflowers, and the aspen were sprouting profusely. And what I found stagged on the wildflowers were big clumps of wolf hair. The wolves were shedding their hair, because that's when they shed, it's in July. And there were grizzly bears all over the place. And there were elk everywhere eating the new growth that came from the aspen that had been burned, but eating very cautiously. And the whole place was just like filled with songbirds, including some very rare species and some that are dependent on fire. And it was just like so full of life. So that's what happens just in six weeks when you go from this this is a fire-dependent system to be optimally healthy, but it also equally depends on those wolves. If the wolves had not been present in that system, those elk would have destroyed all that new growth, even in just six weeks. And that's what's been observed at every site where they've tried to restore aspen communities using fire, but there hasn't been wolves. And there have been about seven or eight studies throughout the Rocky Mountains that have been done from Colorado to Utah to Wyoming, uh, some in Montana as well. So the first fire, which was set in 2008, this is a site um, 15 months later. And you can see these are elk, very happy elk. But um, we put transects through all of this. And so wolves are coursing through this looking for elk that aren't paying attention. And what we found were some very interesting patterns in elk behavior. So um, we had 17 GPS collared elk. Um, I don't use collars on animals anymore. I used to, and I learned what I needed to that way. But like Russell, I found that sometimes collared animals um, are killed by people and it also stresses them to be handled. So now what um, my field crew and I do are we use non-invasive methods to monitor what wolves and elk are doing. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. So this is our classroom. Um, half of these people are volunteers. Um, three of them are field crew members, are field technicians. We're sitting there in our study site. Um, we're eating chocolate. About um, five minutes before this picture was taken, we'd had a gnarly encounter with a grizzly bear female with a cub. We, we were pulling a transect tape, and we had everybody who works in grizzly country's worst nightmare. We're pulling this tape through this dense thicket of aspen. It was really dense because it had burned, and it, everything was growing vigorously. The ecology of fear, right? Well, we had our own ecology of fear lesson. We're pulling this tape, dead reckoning, um, into this thicket. And out comes this grizzly bear cub, cub of the year, romping towards us to see what we're doing, full of curiosity. And of course, right behind it was mom. And she growled at us, which is usually what they do before they charge you. And I've had a couple hundred grizzly bear encounters doing this work and also living where I live. There's a very high density of grizzly bears at my Montana home. And we've never had an incident in the field, given that we encounter grizzly bears so frequently, where anybody's been hurt or there's been a bad outcome of any kind. But that's because we all, we have very strict protocols about how to do this, and it involves respect, respecting the bears. And as Jay said, you know, you need those positive chemicals running through your brain, so um, we are debriefing and eating chocolate. And, <laughs> 
and these, these people, these volunteers and my crew, you know, they, they get it. This is what it's like to be in this wild system, and this is how you're able to be immersed in it and be safe while you're being respectful of the natural processes, including grizzly bears and their babies. So this is the, the um, Earthwatch mission statement, to engage people in scientific research, field research, that has an educational component to promote understanding and action necessary for a sustainable environment. So it's learning by doing, and I'm learning by doing alongside all these volunteers and field technicians. And I learn as much from the volunteers as, as they learn from me. In fact, I probably learn more from them. They're amazing. And these are scenes from my project. This woman here was, is a teacher, and she was an Earthwatch volunteer. She actually got a teaching fellowship to Kenya. And the next year, she decided she wanted to volunteer on my project. And she's volunteered uh, for me five times now. Um, but she is an educator and a brilliant leader in her field. She's a high school science teacher. She just retired. But she's an example of, of the Earthwatch ethos. And I've, I've had this awareness and appreciation for it for so long. And now it's such a, a great pleasure and honor to be working alongside my Earthwatch colleagues to advance this mission. Um, here we are at a wolf den. Those are bones. Wolf dens, around a wolf den you find a bone yard. They're all elk bones. Um, this is a member of Canadian Parliament and a rancher. And this is a school teacher from New Jersey, from an inner city school, from one of the most at-risk student populations in New Jersey, who joined me as a volunteer. And the, the, um, the member of parliament, um, he lives on his family homestead, where he's like sixth generation Albertan. Um, he, his hobby is botany. I say hobby, he's, he's considered as proficient as the top botanist in Alberta, and he's giving this teacher a botany lesson. The teacher is now a graduate student at a university in the Northeast looking at climate change and plants. So most of the people you're going to see here started out as volunteers and are now graduate students or have finished their graduate educations. And they started out, some of them, as volunteers who had never been in the field before. So here is what volunteers do on my project. It's all non-invasive sampling. Um, we pull transect tapes together and mark plots. We look at that three-level food web that is plants, what the animals are doing, the herbivores like the elk, and then what the wolves are doing. So we measure the plant community very thoroughly. We look at the canopy cover, um, tree mortality, how much um, browsing is going on. And then we do track transects, where we track deer and elk. We visit areas that, with camera traps, we document it as being hot spots of wolf activity. And we look at what is going on there ecologically. We also do wolf den surveys. And we look at what the other carnivores are doing. There's a lot of cougars and a lot of grizzly bears in this system. So the wolves we pay special attention to, especially their travel corridors, because that affects what the elk are doing. What we're finding, um, this is the first five years of data. Now we have three more years. And with Earthwatch funding, we're going to have another three years, is that um, these are ages of aspen. So these are the adult trees. These are the years since the fire. So these are the trees that are over the height that an elk can eat, which is about seven feet. Um, these are the ones that are um, the young trees that are just growing above the height that elk can eat. That's called the recruiting class of aspen. They're completely missing from any aspen forest where there are no wolves, whether they have burned or not burned. So what we found was a huge amount of recruitment. And the trees started taking off about the, above the height that elk could reach right in year three. So, and these trees, um, there's no difference in these other classes of trees, as you can see. But it's these young trees that are greatly impacted by fire in a wolf system. 
So this is um, a couple hundred thousand GPS collar locations. This is a fire footprint. And you can see that the elk are completely avoiding the interior of that aspen stand. And when we looked at browsing, we saw that as you get farther from the edge, browsing really tapers off. There's an elk trail here that's a very, very old elk trail, and that's why there's that spike there. So this is the simple picture. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about what happened when we fitted 70 statistical models to look at all the possible factors that could be affecting what the elk are doing and how the aspen are growing. But um, the worse the fire, the more severe the plot, uh, the, a plot had burned, the more those aspen were recruiting above the height of elk. And remember that picture I showed you of that alpha female with all of that debris on the ground from the fire. Those are very dangerous sites to stand around and eat if you're an elk. And also, the farther in from the edge you got, the more those aspen were growing into the canopy of the forest. And that is also, we think, we thought it could be an ecology of fear effect, but it really took multivariate models to tease that out. So we looked at what factors are influencing elk browsing on aspen and what factors influence aspen recruitment. We had 34 variables, we tested them all, and then we, we narrowed it down to a subset of variables that were all significant in some way. And then we looked at their interaction to see which ones rose to the top. And what we found was that the fire made the aspen sprout. And that elk, so the density of elk in this system was 24 elk per square kilometer, which is one of the highest elk densities recorded anywhere in North America. It's as high, it's higher than Yellowstone at its highest point. It's as high as the elk density in Rocky Mountain National Park and Banff National Park, that some of you may have heard of that. And in all of those places, without wolves, the elk destroyed the plant communities, all the shrubs and the, and the young trees. So in this case, even with that density of elk, those, you saw that figure where those trees are just growing into the canopy. Elk avoided the areas that had the best food. Why? Well, after discussing this with park managers who have been partners in this and people in the ranching community and plant ecologists, we think that this is an ecology of fear thing because it's, it's not normal for an animal to to not eat, not go to eat where the best food is. And there's other things that could, this could be related to, such as the fire improving the grassland community, although that only happens for a very short period, for two years. So that wouldn't explain the effects we were ex experiencing in year five. So I'm going to close with um, this model. If we want to have a sustainable future, we need science and education and communication all together on everything that we do on each project. project. And that nexus there, that's where Earthwatch fits in. That's what Earthwatch does. So a sustainable future depends on programs like Earthwatches. These are images from my project. And you can see this is learning by doing. And this is how we stay safe on my project. This is what a, a typical field crew looks like. So it, it's this feeling of exploration and discovery and going into places like here in the Northern Rockies or the Amazon and being unafraid. I need to share a, a quick story. Is Tina Phillips still in the audience? Yes. Tina is a PI at Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So um, I started out uh, doing Project Feeder Watch with my kids when they were like three and four years old. And I knew nothing, really nothing, about my natural environment. I had, we had moved to Montana. And my kids were really curious. So I was a citizen scientist, a mom, a stay-at-home mom with two little kids, a feeder watcher. It's directly because of my involvement in Cornell's program, wolves returned to my landscape, and we started to see this trophic cascade and the bird community shifting because there was all this new growth where informally the elk had been keeping everything mowed down. And because of that, my family said, Mom, you should go to school and study this. 
So I did. And so here I am. And it's because of citizen science. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh my gosh, we have the fishbowl coming back. And then we have our last final speaker. So we would call on Bill Muma and Christina to each pick one out of the hat.